hills and build them high Makes a long time climbing before I die I want the chance to spit in his eye Oh, well, he gave me balls, but I can see between To a dusty yard and long gone green They call that freedom, if you know what I mean And I drown my sorrows, but the whiskey's gone Hello everybody, welcome to Long Bangers, I'm Matty, this is episode 87. Tonight I am joined by John. John, how are you doing? I'm alright, how are you? You were more quizzical there than normal. Aye, you looked almost I was, concerned. I was interested to see what the answer was, given after uh, short bangers, you kind of had a wee think about it. Um, after short bangers, I so I've spoke to my adopted dad since then, he said like you were just on a different planet, like people were talking about things and you were just so out of sync with them. He said, you need to do that more often. <laughs> yeah, I agree with him. My favourite bit was the, the precise moment when you'd argued about a uh, melted cheese toastie being something in between two bits of melted cheese and your argument to prove the point was a peanut butter sandwich. And I said to you, no, but by your logic, that would be two bits of peanut butter with something in between. And your I... face just went... <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. So I'm a I'm a big fan of language and like and how people use language. So we we've talked before about films like uh, Airplane, Naked Gun, yeah. and I think that's probably where it comes from. Uh, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, all that sort of stuff. Actually, it's pronounced Frankenstein. Um, <laughs> but I love this sort of I love mucking about with words, and it it, it occurred to me after we were talking about it on short bangers, like I was arguing like a sandwich is something between two pieces of bread, but it changes when you put something else in front of it. So if you say melted cheese sandwich, it's melted cheese becomes a filling. I know that this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like it just, it starts occurring in my head and then my mouth and my brain are operating <laughs> at different speeds. And then everything starts to catch up again. I'm like, oh fuck, what have I said now? But I think that was my favourite short bangers that we did. Just, it started off fine, and I don't think I even clocked you drinking the haggis bombs either. I saw you taking the first one, and then maybe one or two other ones. I certainly didn't see you getting all six of them away. So I don't know about, I So I saw someone had uh, commented afterwards saying that me and Brian should go shot for shot. It made me think of like the old westerns with uh, the tequila, or, or is it ah, Raiders of the Lost something. Ark? Do you know the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where uh, I, he was in the bar, and, and she sat in... Yeah, drinking with the women in the bar, yeah, yeah, and she she does that doing the shots of whatever that is must must be tequila or something. So I, at some point when we break lockdown, we'll definitely we we'll definitely do that. It doesn't have to just be me and Brian. It could be any of the long buyers listeners, and we'll just drink till we drop. Yes, yeah. All, all for that, we could go shot for shot with each other. Have point. you ever? Have you got any drinks that make you go a bit? Weird. Like, is there anything in particular? Where'd you start? Um, nah, no, no, really. To, to be honest with you, can drink most things. I just get silly when I'm drunk. That, that's the that's the main thing. Get get silly, uh, and, uh, then, and then vomit. Um, <laughs> I'm probably not great on whiskey. Like, whiskey, I think, doesn't agree with a lot of people. Um, so I tend to avoid it. I don't drink it very much at all. I. I, I suggested years and years and years ago um, of having Jaeger cam, which was me drinking Jaegermeister uh, or, you know, Jaeger bombs or whatever it happened to be, and then having a, a camera attached to me for when I got home to find out what it was I was doing, because one night after quite a few Jaeger bombs, because they are so, so easy to drink, especially with um, a mixer involved. Yeah. God knows how many I drank, but I went home and I rearranged the kitchen. Um, I woke up in the morning, there was uh, a packet of scones that had been removed from the, the cellophane, so they were like the cheap scones at uh, Morrison's or whatever, and I'd restacked the scones in the cupboard, but without the cellophane on them. Um, the cupboard under the sink had just been totally rearranged, there was a stool sitting in front of it. I've got absolutely no idea, no recollection of doing anything in the kitchen. Um, so I, I, that was aye. me, six shakers in and just operating at a different frequency for everyone else. It's pretty decent. Yeah, I never. I don't think I ever fall for uh, or go for for rearranging the house or anything like that. I tend to be, um, hi, just getting pass out pretty much. Aye, I mean the other the other stage <laughs> of me being drunk is just getting really really sleepy. Aye, that's me without being drunk though these days. Uh, anyway, we've got 
Hibs versus Motherwell to talk about today. Before we do that, thanks to everybody who um, has joined us on Recast. So I wanted just to, to spend a wee moment to explain the decision to, to put stuff on uh, Recast because I had a, a few messages about it over, since the weekend. So Quick Bang 6, which was a great episode, uh, is only available on Recast unless you're overseas and at the moment. If you're overseas and want to watch it, you can give us a shout on uh, Twitter and we'll sort you out. Um, and we only put that one on exclusively because it was our first video uh, on Recast. So we, we spoke to Recast just before we went into the weekend and we were able to put content on there. And when we put content on there, it benefits Hibs. So there's a couple of ways that it benefits Hibs is that A, Hibs are on there already. So if people are on watching our stuff, they'll probably watch Hibs stuff because it's better produced and better quality and more entertaining uh, than us. Um, but also... Anybody who watches one of our videos on Recast, some of that goes to Hibs. So Hibs get paid anytime somebody watches a video of ours on Recast. So there was a big win-win for us to, to do it. And it doesn't involve anybody paying for the content. So nobody has to go in and do a switch transaction or PayPal or Patreon or anything like that. You can support the podcast and support Hibs by using Recast instead of YouTube, for example. Uh, you use YouTube. Google get paid, you use Recast, Hibs get paid. That's the way you look at it. So that's why we went with it. We won't have everything exclusive on Recast going forward. We will still continue to put out long bangers, short bangers, quick bang um, across all the podcast players. We will still use YouTube. Um, we will just ask people to watch us on Recast instead as a, as a preferred option. Um, and we will have some exclusive content on uh, Recast, but that'll be something that isn't available now anybody else anyway. So uh, you won't be missing out. And you definitely won't miss out if you go and watch it. So does that make sense, John? Did I explain that well? Aye. In a nutshell, you had to pause there, that on Recast. No, I had to pause to consider <laughs> consider what I was saying. Watch, watch long buyer stuff on Recast and Hibs will make money off the picket. That's it, in a nutshell. It's a win-win. Aye. Win. Aye. Dead easy to use, free to sign up. You get other folk to sign up, you get credits. Other rest that share our content, you get credits. You use those credits to watch more videos. Dead easy. It's worth pointing out as well that it's not just a website. There is a way that you can put it onto your home screen on your phone and use mm -hmm. it as an app, like you would Twitter, like you would Facebook or Instagram or whatever your apps of choice are and uh, I know that Matty was looking at the wee iPhone screen recording maybe we'll get some instructions out there and I'll do the same from an Android point of view because I'm not a big fan of Apple Aye, easy enough to do, I like Apple two, took two seconds to do it you just go to share and then add to your home screen from the web page and that's you, you've got the app on your, your phone, anyway uh, please go follow us and actually watch out for a really 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 good competition we've got coming up um we spoke to Hibs today and they've kindly agreed to give us a signed top with uh, bangers on the back uh, to give away as a, as a prize. So we'll put the put that competition up on Twitter shortly after this goes out live, I think. I'm glad you told people what the prize was because I know that people maybe would have thought it was going to be a jumbo pack of Abernethy biscuits or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is our, well, was that our last competition we did? So far we've done two competitions, I think, Abernethy biscuits and also to come on the podcast, which you won, John, and that's how you ended up a permanent fixture. I, I mean, I was only meant to be on the ones, but here I am about 400 episodes later. No, there was the there was the other competition as well, was it? Uh, oh, shorts, was, was it shorts. shorts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is better than Mark Bell shorts, I would say. But not as good as Abernathy biscuits. No. 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 And there was a cries of foul play because uh, Dave O'Rourke won the, the biscuits and he, he works in our build. doesn't work beside you either of us, but um, he works in our building. Aye, so it was there randomly was no generated fate. by a spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, it was random generated. It just was a twist of fate. It, do you know, funnily enough, that, like, that was, so I did do that on a spreadsheet. I found like some, I think I, I believe you. Googled, <laughs> I will. I googled how to pull it a random number. So I. Okay, well, we talk about football. Do we, we have, have to? to? Aye. Okay, that was coming in. So, Hibs now, Motherwell 2. Where did it all go wrong, John? <laughs> <laughs> 
Do you know, actually, um, I don't know about anyone else, but when, I think after the news midweek, when uh, Dougie Tripod had been announced that he'd signed a new deal, um, when he wasn't in the starting lineup and he wasn't in the subs bench, I thought, oh, like, is, is this all the, the sort of planets aligning? It's because <laughs> I, I didn't, I, like, got, there was no, I don't know what the chat is these days about um, injury announcements. Um, do you just find out on the day when folk aren't in the squad? But it used to be that, you knew when someone was maybe struggling and had a wee niggle or something. I don't know if it was announced in a, a pre-match press, press conference or anything. I think it depends when it happens. I think um, Tuki Tripod's injury was a knock, so it maybe happened on the training on, on Friday, okay. if, if they do that, maybe post-press conference. So maybe we weren't aware of it. Or they maybe didn't want Motherwell to know, which would be the other thing. You know, Why would you give them the heads up that he wasn't playing if you, if you don't have to? Because they would probably prepare for him playing. Yeah. That's true. Um, Motherwell have been a wee bit of a bogey team, I think, for Hibs. I've got no spreadsheets, no data to back this up, other than a gut feeling that Hibs tend to... I wouldn't say that they struggle, just I think sometimes when Hibs need a result or they're looking for a result, they don't get one when they're playing Motherwell. Um, something else I was thinking about as well is um, when Hibs played Ross County, John Hughes had just re recently taken charge. And obviously Graham Alexander had just recently taken charge mm -hmm. of Motherwell. So I was, in, I was interested to see how that change might have impacted on Hibs' preparation. Like, was there maybe like some sort of, you know, was there a curveball that Graham Alexander threw in there? Has he got them playing slightly different that might impact on Hibs' preparations? I, I just don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really watch Motherwell. So they hadn't won at Easter Road for years. Do you, just to, to go... 2013. Aye, so seven, so seven years uh, and a bit. So that, is that a wee bit misleading? Because obviously Hibs were at the... The, the Premiership for what four years three four years three years yeah three years in the Championship but still there's still a good number of years that they haven't won at Easter Road um, I was surprised by that stat because I was the same as you John tend to be one of these teams that I think we're either brilliant against Motherwell or, or we struggle there doesn't seem to be that in between because even when we have draws like the 0-0 earlier in the season I thought we didn't play particularly well in that game and Motherwell probably felt quite aggrieved not to take something more than a draw from it. Yeah, um, was that the game? Was Turnbull still playing for Motherwell yes, in that game? I, I think he'd just come back for injury. I'm sure, he, sure he was playing for them. Yeah, um, and he, you know he had a, he had a good game. They played well against us. Maybe didn't do enough to win it, but they definitely spoke about it afterwards as if they thought that they had done enough to uh, to take all three points. But then mm. we went to Fur Park, and it was about three 0 when we played them there. So it's. Mixed fortunes, really, between the two sides yeah. this season. I thought Motherwell were very competent against us. I think they, tactically, they set up very well. One of the things that uh, they did was they put three up front. That was my recollection of it. It looked like they were playing three up front against our three centre-halves. And I don't think we dealt with that at all well. I made the comment on... Uh... <clears throat> quick bang on Saturday because uh, I think your mate Colin had mentioned about Alec Miller and any time he's in the studio uh, comment on a Hibs game Hibs put a stinker Aye. Um, and I like most I, of Alec Miller <laughs> I, it, it almost pains me to say that like Alec Miller for, for for all he's remembered as being a bit of a dour face bastard I think when he was at Easter Road and he was you know he, he's uh the way his time ended, it was like it had gotten a wee bit poisonous. I can't remember who it was that, uh, when we had the conversation. Was, was it when Ian, we had Ian Hoon on? Yeah, Ian Hoon was, was talking about it. A bit of chat about that. Was Ian saying that Alec Miller stepped down because he wanted to spare the players from that the poisonous atmosphere that developed? Right. But Alec Miller, after Hibbs, had gone on to have a pretty good career. And he was, I think he was assistant to Gerard Hooley when he was at Liverpool, when Liverpool won the Champions League. Benitez. Uh, Benitez, was it Benitez? Uh, sorry. I'm not sure it was Benitez that won the I think Julia maybe got them to the final and lost, if I remember right. But I think it was Aye. Benitez that won the, the Champions League of Liverpool. But yes, your point stands. Alec Muller was assistant. Aye, so Alec Muller knows his football. Alec Muller knows his football. And I think the two times that we've watched them now, so he talked about Ross County, where Ross County playing an extra man in midfield. And I think he mentioned Mahibs maybe having to try and explore, uh, exploit the width. Yeah. And I, I think he mentioned much the same on, on Saturday there um, because Motherwell were playing really narrow. And it, it pains me that on both occasions, you know, the sort of the old guard of football, if you like, can see that 
but the guy in the dugout hasn't hasn't recognised that. That that's a wee bit of a sore one to take because I think one of the things that Jack Ross has become known for and that's been commented mm-hmm. on is um, his willingness to change formation mm-hmm. and willingness to combat what other teams are doing. It's, it's a really interesting point you make because I actually saw there's a stat on Hibs.net where the person had listed points won from winning positions. Hmm. Um, oh, sorry, from losing positions. Get that correct. And Hibs were fair terrible. I don't think we'd, we ever had one win or no wins all season from when we've been behind. Mm-hmm. And the argument there is, well, if we go behind, the manager doesn't know how to change it. And therefore, that's we, that's indicative of a reluctance to change. And when I saw that, I thought, I don't think that's correct because, A, we've won loads of games and we've there's loads of games where we've not been behind because we wouldn't be sitting third in the league if yeah. we were going behind loads. So either he's setting up the team correctly at 0-0 or he makes changes at 0-0 to put us in front and then we can see out games. Calvin Charlton, when he was on, said that he finds Jack Ross, but I can't remember his exact phrase, but he said it's hard to keep up with the amount of changes when he's trying to go and say, like they they track how effective we are with each formation and each system. Mm-hmm. It's actually difficult to keep track because Jack Ross will tweak so many things through the game that you, you maybe don't pick up unless you're really looking for it. So mm-hmm. I think it I think it does change things. I think it does look at um you know how the game's going and try to do it. I do worry about this this that we we can't seem to come back from a goal down, but then actually that's pretty consistent across the league as well. If you look at how many teams actually win, you're talking most teams maybe having two, maybe three times out of the season where they've done it. It's not huge numbers. So I, I think I saw the, the same thread and someone had replied to it saying that Hibs had only lost so many points from losing positions, which was almost... Um, it was almost like the, the opposite side of the coin, if you like. So if Hibs had, you know, only picked up three points from however many games from losing positions, they'd also lost the same number of points from losing positions. So it was exactly the same almost. Yeah. Um, and I think when I was watching the game with my adopted dad, he was, he said that he reckoned, and again, it would be interesting to go back and have a look at this, he didn't think that there was much of a gap between, or sorry, Teams, with the exception of Rangers, perhaps, mm-hmm. weren't going out and absolutely steamrolling their opponents. It was only like maybe a couple of goals in it, and it must like I, I don't know. Is it, it, it can it be especially easy to go back? So it, you know, on, on Saturday they have found themselves two goals behind. So they had they lost the goal first half, and then yeah. they lost the goal within a minute in the second half. How how easy or difficult do you think it is to go back and get three goals at that point? I don't imagine that it that it is that easy. No, uh, yeah, it's not, and, and particularly when you look at how Motherwell played, because, and I will give, I'm not. This isn't a criticism of Motherwell in any way, shape, or form. But they, you talk about parking the bus, when they had the two goal lead to, to to hold on to, and Hibs started to take more of the ball. So Jack Ross made the three changes, we changed our shape, we got on the ball more, and we started forcing the issue a bit more. But Motherwell, just, there was no space. You look at how deep Motherwell played, and they had the yeah. odd break, but. But they weren't playing attacking football at that point. And quite right, you know, they, they had a two-goal lead. They're more than entitled to, to hang on to it. But if you were looking at trying to break that down, you're having to find a way yeah, to, to break down an 11-man defence. And Hibs just couldn't do it. We, we, we were, I don't know, somebody had tweeted, I had, I had tweeted saying, if we can score before, I think it was about 70 minutes, I think we'll take something from it. Because when you get 2-1, the dynamic of the game changes. And the first week yeah. they came back said we could play all day and no score. And I can't even reading that tweet, you go, they're right. They just, it just had that feel of a game about it. That yeah. I, I mean, we'll talk about Dodge in a wee minute. Um, but we were misfiring. They, their goalkeeper, I got irrationally annoyed at their goalkeeper as well because he was a smug wee shite through the game. Like he did that kind of dummy. Uh, I think Cadden was called dummy on Cadden. And then he, he, he had a couple of saves that none of them were, were especially good saves. You know, like he didn't have to, to, like a save you wouldn't expect a goalkeeper to make. Even the one for Doidge, which was was close in, all he's done was get close to the ball to, to, yeah. to save it and uh, let it bounce off him. But he had that kind of smug 
fucking all pleased with himself, like he was celebrating goals and everything. He really wound me up. Eh? That's that's pathetic. I'm 43 years old. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, this boy's a dick. Like I was, I was praying we were going to score just to get it right around them. Kind of like how you sometimes have that wee, oh, fucking just shut him up. It's probably the same feeling, and it's maybe magnified a wee bit more because you would probably have more visuals to the goalkeeper. Um, you would probably see him more yeah. than up close, but is at the game, the most you can probably have a gripe about him is when they take, you know, when they delay the, you know, taking a goal kick, for example. Aye. It's weird, like, really, I don't know how we, some of these things that are cropping up just because of this lockdown football, it's, it's going to be a different world, like, when we go back to, like, there's, like, like you say, like, getting upset about Liam Kelly because he, maybe, because you perceive it, maybe you're looking <laughs> a wee bit smug. Aye. It's not going to happen in like six, twelve months' time. It's stupid, eh? I think maybe it was. Is it, the, sorry, the, is it Liam Kelly? I think it is Liam Kelly. I'm, I, I'm assuming that. Like I, I'd seen Liam Kelly mentioned before, but I've said numerous times I pay no attention to anyone else. Uh, de- definitely, than... definitely Kelly. I don't know what his first name is, but definitely somebody Kelly. Liam Kelly sounds about right. But then I think that annoyed me as well because then it sounds like Ian Skelly, who used to sell cars back when we were <laughs> we. And uh, <laughs> I. When you watch a Glenn Michael's cartoon Cavalcade, when that adverts came on for that, you would generally get an Ian Skelly one on or Scott Sport. Uh, Liam Kelly is not the Motherwell goalkeeper. Liam Kelly is a boy that plays for Coventry. Right. So who's the Motherwell goalkeeper then? Fuck well, knows. So Motherwell find this, uh... Uh, No, it's Liam Kelly. Oh, right. There's two. Chances. Well, that's even more reason to be annoyed then. So you've got an original name. <laughs> And you can't be that smug when someone else has got your exa- name. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. If you've borrowed somebody else's name, you need to know your place. <laughs> I think uh, the other thing is when you see a goalkeeper no absolutely raging. <laughs> you know, the, you the fun we've had from Alan McGregor, you kind of have that expectation for all of them now, and he disappointed. So, did you see the exchange between Craig Gordon and an Inverness player? Aye, who was given the bad breath sub, uh, signal. Aye, do you reckon? Craig Gordon's got bad breath. Aye. Definitely. Definitely. I don't know, it's not something I'd ever considered before until I saw it. But you can tell because it's a jambo. <laughs> like it, it's par for the course, isn't it? What, what got me about that incident is I think the boy just jumped for a header with him. And maybe, you know, he's maybe late and he's he's jumped into him a wee bit. But, fuck me, goalkeepers do that to players all the time. Every time a goalkeeper comes to across the clatter folk, Aye. What a brass neck. Do you know what I mean? Like it's not like Craig Gordon's no just jumped through somebody before. Aye. He, got, he got all uh, acting hard and everything. You're like, come on. Because of the referee, he's like one of these hud, hud me back, hud me back. <laughs> Come for a fight. It's kind of everybody's getting in the way of it. It was nonsense. I can't stand Craig Gordon either. Eh? He's another one that's high on my list of pricks. <laughs> I'm starting to think that you have an issue with goalkeepers. <laughs> nah, didn't mean goalkeepers in general. Didn't like the mother well goalkeeper. Didn't like Craig Gordon. Craig Gordon, my dislike of him goes back to the Dean Shields inc- incident. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was out of order in that game, and although Dean Shields was also to blame, so he this isn't me saying, oh, it's all Craig Gordon's fault that Dean Shields got himself sent off. He cheated. Craig Gordon, hundred percent cheated in that uh, incident. Feigned injury, stepped in front of Dean Shields as well. You watch him; he steps in front yeah. of him. He had no reason to be good like he, like he did. And it's I, the dark arts that we're not a fan of, eh? Yes, I have held that grudge for years. And I'm not, I know I'm not alone in that one. And I don't absolve Dean Shields any blame for it as well. He, he was an idiot for giving him the opportunity to do it. But Craig Gordon, you thought for a while he was going to require an ambulance on the pitch. Remember the Milan keeper when the Celtic fan ran on? No, oh, neither. Aye. <laughs> he let two stretcher bearers carry him off the pitch. Can you imagine how, like, at some point you've gone, oh, I should probably get up now, but I've, I'm in, I've jumped two feet in. I, I'm going to let these guys, old guys, carry me off the pitch as if I'm hurt from a fresh air swipe by a fan. Don't back down, double down. Like, if the stretcher bearers come out, you have to get on and you I, have to be carried off. And like, but, but, what, what amazed me is how everybody just went along with it. Do you know, every, like, the stretch, if I was a stretcher bearer, you'd be going, fucking, really? Come on, uh, are we doing this? I don't, can, we, can we just take you behind the goal? Because they, they went the long way. It's like, can we not just take you behind the goal and put you down? You can be all right. Live their mind. No, 
I'd be fucking raging that that walk. It'd be one of those ones like I could drop him, give him something to moan about. <laughs> Have you seen that video of the boy with the stretcher when he picks it up and he basically puts the boy's face in his arsehole? Aye. <laughs> Amazing. That's one of the best things uh, uh, I've seen in uh, football. Was that because you you kind of think, how does that not happen more often? Aye. The way the way that he picks <laughs> the way that he picks him up, he'd say it at us. You think that must surely happen more often than we've seen it. Um, and then it's that sort of calamitous thing that, that um, makes me think. Of, do you remember the boy that kicked the ball off his own face to score a own goal? Now, I can't remember what team we played. We, for. It was English aye, football. We talked about it. It's like is it old? It's maybe no black and white footage, but it's certainly no, that sort of. It's, it's type 90s. Field. I would say 90s football. I don't think it's any older than the 90s. And he's facing his own goal, tries to hook the ball away, scalps it in his own, <laughs> his own face, and uh, shoots past the goalkeeper. It's the, my favourite own goal of all time. Even better than when Lee Dixon chipped uh, Dave Seaman, if you remember that one, because that was a peach as well. No, I don't remember that one. So, um, they played for, for Arsenal. Yeah, how many times did David Seaman get lobbed? Oh, well, Seaman and lobbed is, is <laughs> you know, words that you hear together quite frequently. But who, who was the Brazilian player that did it to him as well, wasn't it? What was his name? Na- Na- Naeem or something like that? No, wasn't he? Oh, name? Naeem was Naeem. Uh, for... Was it, it was the Brazilian, was he? So Naeem did it first, I think, in terms of like the high-profile ones. Yeah. I'm not sure about the Lee Dixon one, but the two high-profile ones were Naeem and and uh, then it was Ronaldinho in the World Cup. Right enough, Ronaldinho did it. Well, Lee, Lee Dixon had the... Uh, he, he was at Highbury, I'm sure, playing, obviously playing for Arsenal. And he's under no pressure and he just looks around and just pings it back to the keeper. But just too high. And just lobs him. It's fantastic. Cause he, as soon as it leaves his boot, you go, yeah, beauty. <laughs> That's him. It's a shame as well, because uh, David Seaman was a quality keeper. He was. Like he's, he's save against Sheffield United. I think it was when he was maybe like forty year old or something. It was phenomenal. This is uh, for the header that, that it was in all the way. I'm sure it was like a kind of close range header. Paul, I want to say it was Paul Pesca Salido with a header, and uh, I Siemens basically um, caught it out almost from behind the goal line. Aye, that was an incredible save. He was a good goalkeeper, David Seaman. Moustache as well. You have to admire a goalkeeper that wears a moustache. I think no, no many people can carry off a moustache and a ponytail at times as well. Huh? He was. He should Jackson have been a porn star, really. <laughs> Maybe we've got him reincarnated in our midfield now. It Raised certainly looked like David Seaman was in midfield for Hibs on Saturday. <laughs> I can't even remember how we got into that, John. Um, no uh, Liam keepers. Kelly. <laughs> yeah, Liam Kelly. I really wanted us to equalise, not just because you want Hibs to take something for the game, but I wanted us to equalise to shut him up. And also Tony Watt, who went down every time somebody went near him. It really, Tony Watt pains me because, and I know that I definitely talked about this when I think it was maybe the the first game at Easter Road. He's not a bad player. Mm-hmm. I think that he has the ability to be playing somewhere other than Motherwell. No disrespect to Motherwell, because I think when Tony Watt burst into the scene at Celtic, most people probably thought that he was going to play for Celtic or. Yeah somewhere other than Celtic, like at least that sort of level. And then he, he's through various career moves, he's found himself at Motherwell. Um and he, he's not a bad player and he like he, he seems to indulge in the dark arts. Like you were saying, like there was a lot of theatrics Aye. on Saturday. Um like you say, like clutch in the face, there was I think there was an incident with Stevenson um over on the touchline. Stevenson's kinda of looking at him like, what the fuck are you up to? I thought you did um, but at the same time like he doesn't need to be getting involved in that sort of stuff because his uh, outside of the right foot pass for the boy Roberts for their opening goal was phenomenal. Yeah, it was it was good football from a good football. He doesn't need to get involved in anything else. It was funny because I, I tweeted about it. I think I said it goes down more more often than Hearts. Um, was the the tweet that I made? And obviously after Motherwell had won, and the next day you start getting Motherwell fans tweeting you. Motherwell fans, obviously, you never hear from. And at other time when they're shite, um, and Motherwell fans that I have never in my life tweeted to them when their team's been shite. But the first one sent me a picture and it was like a wee gif of uh, Tony Watt. I uh, just replied and said, thanks, it's uh, nice to know what it looks like with his hands over his <laughs> face. <laughs> but uh, uh, he, annoyed, he annoyed me, but he had a good game and he caused their defence problems. What, what's the issue with their defence, John? We, we, when we've, we face teams like that are quite physical, 
do you think there's an issue there, or were we just unlucky on the day? I don't know if it's. I don't think we lacked physicality in the team. I don't think there's any real shrink in violets there. Um, there was a really good bit of analysis that I watched earlier from a boy uh, called 9125 Analysis. I think he's a Hibs fan. Really impartial breakdown um, of how the goals came about. Um, and one of the things that he talked about was Hibs being vulnerable to the counter-attack. Mm-hmm. And the second goal in particular, I think he mentioned that there seemed to be a bit of confusion between uh, Joe Newell and... Uh, fuck I'm not sure on his first name now, Chris Cadden. Yeah, Chris Cadden. About who was picking yeah. the Motherwell runner up, and it was the Motherwell runner, I think, that went on to score. So I don't know. I, I think he, I want to say, was Joe Neal playing on the left of midfield? Um, I, I don't know whether it was like there was there was small tweaks that were made to the, yeah. the Hibs midfield and to accommodate Joe Neal and Jack Snurvin to play together. And I wonder if that was something that let us down. Um, just that, you know, I. I like the idea of a, an all-out attack in Hibs side. You know, get all, you know, get as much flair, get as much pace in there as possible. But you do need sometimes a guy in it to do a wee bit of the dirty works. And I wonder if, on reflection, Jack Ross will look at that and say, "I should have played one or the other, but not both." Yeah, or Gogic coming in because that that was um, there's a thread on the PM board on, on Hibs.net, and I made the point about Motherwell's success came from playing three against three. Their, their three forwards against our three uh, defenders and somebody said we should have played Gogic and I said well, I don't really think the midfield was the issue although in hindsight I think the midfield was an issue as well because I don't think we won that battle um, but their point was that if the defenders were struggling Gogic is good at dropping back so maybe if they'd gone it's all ifs and buts and maybe, maybe Gogic would have been in there to spot the danger a wee bit better than, than it was I don't think so I think when you think of Gogic's positioning from where we lose the ball for both goals, or one of them comes to their throw in, um, another one is they, they, they win the ball off of Doig's header. I think I don't think Gogic would have been in that position to, to be deep enough to um, stop either of those goals. So I think the issue was the three against three. That's my, my view on it. I think the thing as well that Mullerwell had up front is they had a bit of pace, and where the goals came from, I think, I think it, I think they just outpaced us. Yeah, like Hanlon, Hanlon's not. A ball here away for the guy. He's just not quick enough to catch up with him. You know, he gets he gets the challenge and he gets the foot in, but the boy gets his shot away early. Yeah, it's the quality scores. of the pass that beats Hanlon rather than yeah, yeah. rather than the yeah. pace. You know, the, the the pass is really good, puts it right into the boy's path, and he gets kind of across Hanlon, but, but Hanlon's struggling to make a, a a decent challenge. So I wonder if there was something in that. So you mentioned um, the the header. Um, I think it's Doidge's Doidge tries to get the flick on, and then. <laughs> straight away Motherwell are on the counter-attack. Do you think there was anything from us being too far up the pitch at that point, like the defence? Because it seemed to be that the ball broke pretty much in the halfway line and the boys threw and scores. Yeah, but, but, but we play quite high anyway. I think most games, we've talked about it before, um, how Hibs are good at controlling games. More often than not, we'll have a good chunk of the possession and kind of limit the number of chances the opposition get and retain control of the ball better. And I think when you do that, the tendency is to play quite high up the pitch because that's you win the ball back and right away you've still got everybody in the, the opponent's half and it makes it difficult for them to break out. And that's how you keep pressure on a team. I don't think we were any higher than we would normally be. I just think Motherwell exploited it. I think they were really good at exploiting it. I think generally when teams come to Easter Road, they don't play three up front and they don't go man for man on their defenders. So, so do you think do you think that the flip side of that is as much as we sometimes have the ability to control the game from the halfway line and in the opponent's half, it can make us vulnerable to the counter attack. Yeah. So rather than us being terrible at defending a counter attack, we're just vulnerable to it because of the way that we play going forward. Yeah, and I, I think that so it could be you look at the pace and the defence, and that could be an issue. It could be the positioning, but there's also the like everything in football is about risk and reward, isn't it? Like you. Any any attack that you, you, you make, you commit men forward. You know if that yeah. if that man's forward, it's no back. It's just it, it's just that logic. You know, either one or the other. So if you're if you're committing team uh, the team high up the pitch, there is that space behind. If you play against a quick team, you either have to be a bit like we don't play that high when we're playing Rangers because Rangers are, are fast or, or Celtic, they're fast. 
In fact, we exploited it with Aberdeen. Did it to us? We put Martin Boyle against their, their centre halves. Yeah. So uh, Aberdeen liked to play, high, you know, a higher defence, and then we got in behind them. It's one of these things. You, there's a value in doing it. It looks bad when you get exploited. Though. If another team takes advantage of it and, and capitalises, you do kind of sit looking, go, was was that the right decision, or should we have been a bit more cautious? Hindsight's a wonderful thing, though, isn't it? Um, at this so at this stage of the season, so like we've not there there was the opportunity there to to try and take the three points that would have put us seven points ahead of Aberdeen with a game in hand yeah. that could effectively have been ten. We're no we're no better off, but we're no worse off than yeah. you know than three o'clock on Saturday. So there's still that opportunity to to try and take advantage of the uh, the game in hand as much as it's at Ross County. We've played played them once already at Easter Road. I don't know if they're going to change anything. Hopefully, we've learned a little bit from that experience. Hopefully, the players are a little bit fresher. Yeah. Um, I sometimes, like you say, it looks shit when you get exploited. But at the same time, like you're still in the business of playing football. You're still, you know, defeat is part of the game. Yeah. It's shit, but sometimes it happens. Yeah. And yeah. That's it. If you're if you're chasing the game and you want to try and win, you have to you have to put men forward and you have to take risks and that's that's what football is. You know, you safe teams didn't do anything. You know, safe safe teams they might avoid relegation, but they didn't win. Fuck all. Do you know what I mean? Like if, right. and folk moan about boring football. Well, I'd rather we take the risks and lose the odd game than than no take the risks and uh, just draw every time. Um, Christian Deutsch. Missed a few chances and keep him for a lot of stick, John. What's uh, your position on Dodge? It's, it's. T- I don't think that the chances that he had were clear cut. I would have preferred that he'd done better naturally. Like I would have preferred that yeah. he got a better shot away. I think. I think one of them. The ball comes past the defender. And I don't think he's expecting the defender not to get anything on it. It kind of, you know, maybe it catches him by surprise or whatever. It takes an awkward bounce in front of him. So he's almost having to try and get like a, a bicycle kick, you know, kind of uh, get a bit of air time on him, if you like. And I know that he used to play basketball, but he was trying, almost trying to get himself horizontal yeah. to try and get a shot on. Um, the other one, I'm trying to think, was he, was he, I'm trying to think. So he, had a, he had one where he was, was, he, was he played, played in through, by... Yeah. But I, like, again, like that one, that one's quite wide. He's, he's having to try and find the far corner. It, remind, it reminded me a little bit of when he was playing, when he first started the Hibs and he was playing up at uh, Pitodre, Um, you know, when he got slaughtered for missing four yeah. chances. Um, you know, folk were saying, I think he could have had a hat-trick in the, the first half, maybe. But the first one, it was never as clear-cut as folk may do. And I don't think that it was as, as clear-cut on Saturday again. Um... So I, I, I don't know, it's easy. I wonder if perhaps, had the result been different, like say we'd drawn, say Dodge doesn't score, but Hibs draw the game, he probably doesn't come in for as much criticism as he did. Yeah. Hibs have got beats and he's an easy target. Mm. Um, I think I'd mentioned before that I thought that the way that Hibs were playing with Dodge up front, with Boyle on one side and Murphy supporting, I thought he was bringing out the best in those players. Um, I don't think we saw the best from... Murphy on Saturday, but I wonder nope. if that was perhaps because we were missing Dougie Tripod and his attacking um, instincts, if you like. I don't think that we had the same instincts going forward from Louis Stevenson. Um, but that being said, like I don't think that Stevenson was poor going forward. Like He delivered a couple of really good balls. I just... I don't know, some, there was a couple of things that didn't quite click on yeah. Saturday. And like I say, we got beat, and I, I think it's perhaps easy to point the finger at folk and say, well... Christian Dodge is they're scoring goals and we've got a three million pound striker sitting on the bench, so let's put him in there. I don't know that I mean, could we honestly say that Kevin Nisbet scores those goals? It's it's easy to say with the benefit of hindsight, well Fulton yeah. Nisbet would have scored. Nisbet that, that's not what we were dealing with. Mm-hmm. And it's you know, it's the same sort of scenario as well, Jamie Gullen scored at the weekend. Well, tough shit. Like Jamie Gullen's I, playing for Ray Rovers, like he's yeah. he's not on Hibs books, so he wasn't going to score for Hibs. That's that's just the way of it. Aye. It's an interesting one with Dodge. Obviously, I like him as as a player. I think he's good. I'd rather have him at Hibs than no have him at Hibs. I think there's there's probably an argument now that um, 
do you know, I think it's something like 17 games without a goal. Who knows about him? I, I think you, you carry... There's two things as a manager. You either take a player out, give him a wee break, and then put them back in after they've kind of been out of the habit of missing chances for a wee while. Or you persevere with them and let them go through the, the difficult patch. I would say 17 games is enough evidence to say that that, that difficult patch isn't the ending anytime soon. Right. I would take him out the side. I would say Nisbet again, if you're if you're Kevin Nisbet, and especially so Nisbet lost a lot of favour with the Hibs fans by putting in the transfer request. Totally understandable. No, none of us like it when a player expresses that they want to leave. He didn't get his move and he's been on the bench since. And it he wasn't setting the heather on fire in the couple of games up to the transfer window either, mm-hmm. generally up to the bid coming in. So there, there was justification for taking him out the side for a number of reasons. But I think if you're Kevin Nisbet and you're, you're sitting going, right, you didn't let me go in January, you're valuing me at £3 million up, but you're not going to play me. And you, instead of playing me, you're playing a guy who's no scoring any chance that he's getting. You know, he's, he's mishitting things, he's hitting them straight at the keeper, he's knocking them wide. I think that's only a tolerable situation for so long before you're like, come on, what? put me in the team. And I think this bit's time is probably now to go in the team and get a run of games to go and show what you can do again. That, that's my take. And I think that there's more reasons to swap them around now than there are to, to persevere with Deutsch. Not, I not don't to get rid of Deutsch, but no now. I, I don't disagree with you whatsoever. I'm just, I, I think my, my concern might be if Hibs continue to play life, it's just a, a like for like replacement. If you play Nisbet alongside yeah. Boyle, do you get the best out of? Because b- because before Saturday there, no one was really questioning the fact that Christian Dodge hadn't scored goals in so many games True. because yeah. because Hibs were winning. Yeah. So now that we've lost, do we say right? Let's change everything. Let's put or no everything. Do we just do we change that one player for example for argument's sake? Do we put Nisbet in beside Boyle? And hope that we get the same performance out of Nisbet that we had from Dodge previously. Hi, and get those players. I think difficult. that works. Or do you change the the formation? Do you go? Because I, I, personally, I, I would go. Maybe it's because of the, the sort of traditionalist in me. I would just go four four two. Yeah. Put Nisbet and uh, Dodge up front because I think they are a good partnership. Um, at least you know, at least on paper. But I think we saw that in the early part of the season as well. But then the difficulty that you have is where does Boyle play? And Boyle's yep. been playing well recently. You can't really put him at right midfield because Chris Cadden's doing a really good job there. And Chris Cadden there was getting the best of Martin Boyle playing up front because he was removing that sort of defensive responsibility. Yeah. And I don't think that we'll, I don't know I, I I don't know the answer. And I think that's some I think that's the when people often say I don't envy Jack Ross at this moment in time. Aye, it's no it's, it's not an easy problem to solve, is it? When you've no. got but. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think the I would always say stick with a winning team as much as possible. And generally, I would say I know it's different in the modern game, but if you have a settled first first eleven, that's your ideal scenario. Is if you hard, hardly have to change it at all, because players they get a familiar familiarity with the other players that they play alongside. Mm-hmm. You tend to get more fluency in your play, more coherence, and you play better. Players know they've got the, the, the jersey, so they have that confidence as well. Modern football, you have more squad rotation because there's more demands on the players to play more games, etc. Uh, so then you think, you, 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 do you swap when you've got a good reason to swap? That, that's the time to make a change. So either after a really bad performance or a really bad result, because sometimes you have a bad performance but, but get the result, you would still look and say, right, it's now the time to change it. But you're also, I, would, I think there's an argument to say, the team's won four in a row with only kind of minor changes. They lost the fifth game. Do you give them the sixth one to put it right? Is that the fair thing to do? Or is that number five you go, right, now is the time to go and say this bit. And Porteous is the other one as well, who a high-value asset to the club, sitting on the bench, you want him on the pitch. It's funny because I think when... Porteous was dropped and McGregor was brought in and he got the goal against Dundee United and you know people prior to that were screaming out for a leader and yeah. McGregor comes in and he puts in a couple of really solid consistent performances I started seeing the same sort of criticisms at the weekend there we've not got a leader you know aye. McGregor's too old and it's aye. some it's of it carried away isn't it aye so I, I know exactly what you're saying I, I think 
I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on this. I think that my change might be putting Gogic in midfield alongside either Irvin or Newell. I think one of the jobs that Jack Ross has got to make is to make an unpopular decision. Yes. Um, that, uh, but to get you know to get the best out of the squad, and I think for balance sake, I think I'd rather have Gogovic alongside one of the two creative guys there, whether it's Jackson. Uh, sorry, Irvin. I've just made the same mistake yeah. as you. Yes. Uh, whether it's Irvin, whether it's uh, Newell, or even Scott Allen in that position, I think the boy that was on uh, Quick Bang had suggested uh, Leon. Mm. Um, he had suggested that Scott Allen comes in for Jackson Irvin. Yeah. Not against it, but I think he needs that. Um, Someone to do the dirty work alongside them. That would be the change I would make. <clears throat> it's um, okay. And, Sorry, carry on. And I, I think, I think that might be the only change that I would really make. Um, but but with the caveat uh, that you say, like maybe I don't know, give Dodge the first half against Ross County, for example. And I wouldn't say that that kind of impacts the rest of the season. But give them forty-five minutes. See, if, you know, give them the opportunity to try and do something and say, right you haven't scored. It's now, you know, 18 and a half games, for example. Let's try something different second half. Yeah. Let's get Nisbet on there. And give Nisbet the opportunity to prove his worth. Because all those things that you were saying before, you know, Hibs are rating him at three million. There's a guy that's not scored in 18 games, blah, blah, blah. We'll go out there and show what you can do better. Hi. Um, it's like, it's like if you ever play football manager. Josh got football manager for the Xbox. He was playing it the, uh, yesterday. And... It's hard. You have players you like, and you kind of fit everybody in the team. That's the difficulty for a football manager. When you look at, particularly our midfield, I think we we are well served, especially with players coming back to fitness now. Alan, Newell, Gogic, um, McGinnis. Then you've got Murphy. Do you know, like the you're missing one particularly important player. Well, Cadden. Who else am I missing? Trey Wright. <laughs> Trey Wright. Well. But, but it's it's a fair point though. Like you, you still you add him, you add him in. And Jay Wright's an example of a manager kind of losing patience with, with somebody who's no been delivering for him. But you kind of play them all at once. Somebody has to miss out. And really, if you've, and I, I suppose this is goes back to the point of making about why Nisbet would be unhappy with Dodge. When you have a lot of good players at the club, and you say to keep your place, you have to perform, mm-hmm. right? And that's the, the mantra that managers go out to players with all the time is if you're playing well, you'll keep your jersey. You have to follow through on that when you didn't play well, though, and say, right, you were shite that game. So Scotty Allen's coming in for you this week or Gogic is coming in for you or Nisbet's coming in for you, whatever it is. You have to make that change because the players waiting on the sideline all see what we see and they all see what the manager sees. And if the managers to have any credibility with them to say, play well on training, as soon as these guys drop the performance, you're in there. If you didn't follow through on that, you you lose all credibility. Like you have you have to follow it through, but you also have to know that if you're a player on the park, that you're maybe so one bad performance I would give them, two bad performances say it's time to change them. If you if you're taking that system, because you you want to know that the manager trusts you enough to give you another chance to put it right. Yeah. But two I think two bad performances in a row, you should be yeah worried about your place. I. <sighs> Just to throw a spanner in the works, I don't think that Doyage had played poorly. The only thing that's really letting him, letting him down is that he's not scoring goals. Would you say that, like, when you're talking about performances, are you just talking about goals with Doyage or are you talking no, but, about all round? But I, I, would, I would flip it, right? So, see, Doyage just had, had a couple of... And I did want to pick on Christian Doyage as well, because that's no real like, game what we're about as a, as, a, as a podcast, but he's got a couple of game-defining moments in that game where he can win points for us which is what you want any player to be able to do to influence the game enough to win points for you he had key moments now if you flip that and say right Paul Hanlon for example has had a great game but three times he's made a mistake that's cost us a goal Mm. right and we end up losing 3-2 or whatever you ask serious questions about it you say right "Ah, he's had quite a good game but actually his impact on the game has been really negative and that's the point I make with Dodge there is that uh, you could probably make an argument that he played all right, but when it really, really mattered and we really needed him to perform, he didn't do it. And that cost us, like ultimately that cost us points in the game. So he, he, he's not to blame for us not winning or not getting a point, 
but he has a significant part in it. Yeah. Uh, yeah that, so, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's how I would view it. it says, if you were assessing his, his performance, I don't think you could say he had a good game because when it mattered, he, he didn't do what needed, was needed. No, I think that's fair. Happy days, right. Uh, talking points from Twitter. We've, uh, I thought we were going to get about 15 minutes to chat about the Motherwell game, John. Honestly, I was like, it was shite. I didn't know what to talk about it. And I think that's been an hour. I think we spent about 20 minutes of that talking about David Seaman's mustache. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best for the others of it as well. Uh, right, let's quickly fire through um, talking points. We've got a few of these to get through. So Alan Neil Duncan is... Uh, our first tweeter said that's three times in as many months all at home too something lacking mentally with this squad no desire or determination we lack a true on-field leader someone who can grip the team push them on and motivate them too often we're turning up expecting to win without any graft so I think there's a couple of things there we had a conversation a wee while back about the lack of a leader yeah. and I think I think there was maybe a wee feeling that it had maybe been resolved with Darren McGregor having come back into the squad. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Has that has that changed because of one disappointing result? No, I don't think so. I, I, th- I think the I don't think it was leadership that was lacking on Saturday. I think we. I, th- I don't know what it is. Like everybody had an off day. I think Tracy said that uh, on on quick bang, and she was spot on with it. Everybody was off it. Like it's hard to find somebody with pass marks, and maybe then you see right. So is that leadership? It had if we had somebody with more leadership, would they have rallied the troops more? I don't know. I I I still. I mean, I, I completely take on board what uh, I think uh, Brian and yourself had mentioned before about leadership, and I still don't know how much someone screaming and hollering in the background makes. Because yeah. I've I've seen the opposite of that. I've seen I've seen managers with this with this passion, you know, kicking water bottles and stuff about, and you know, getting criticised for it. Well, well, what fucking good does that do, kind of thing? Um, but I suppose the question then maybe turns to the you know uh, mental strength, for example. And I don't think I saw anything there that said Hibs were were lacking mental strength. I think they just got caught out by two goals. But you know, for the for the reasons that we discussed before, you know, the, the way Aye. perhaps that we play. It's an inter- the mental strength question is a brilliant one, John, because that again ties in with no being able to win games for when we go behind. Because that's like something switches you and you need to do something. So different you're sitting at nil nil, you know, worst case, you get a point. You know, unless you can see the goal, you're gonna get something from the game. And it's maybe easier from that position to go and chase a goal to, to win the game like you, it's mentally easier to see, see how you can win the game Hibs at the moment look when we can see the goal it's difficult to, for us to see a way back and you look at recent examples uh, cup semi-finals where we went behind um, although we, we did come back in the the cup semi-final we, we, we drew level when we went behind, behind again the second time you can't that was it um, Livy Ross County Motherwell uh, obviously the St Johnson semi that was referring to there we, that mu- there must be an element of mentality comes into that because whether it's like the players don't have another gear to go up to, to try and chase the game or I, I, don't, I don't know whether, whether they've not got the what's the word I'm looking for like that the, the ability to work out what needs to be done to change the game so, and maybe that's leadership again. Maybe that's somebody like taking a shot for thirty yards and, or, you know, whatever running at the defence like Martin Boyle. But but then we had that on on Saturday. Had Boyle try to get to the byline a couple of times, didn't he do very well with it, and then he stopped doing it. It's maybe things like that. Maybe that's where the mental block comes in. That if it doesn't work the first time they do it, they just chuck it. I don't know. I don't know if that's a fair assessment or not. I don't know. I just, I wonder. I wonder if it's just. I wonder if it's just an easy accusation to throw out there. I, I don't mean that disrespectfully, because um, obviously everyone was really, really disappointed with the result, yes. and some people were were angry about it. Um, I just, I, I kind of want to define it a little bit more. I want to know, like, so it's easy to say, Hibs were weak mentally at the weekend. 
I've never thought I've never thought of Hibs being weak mentally. I've never, but then there must have been times where we were strong mentally. Aye, you know, four you know, games previously, and every time aye. that we've we've been in front and seen the game out, are we strong mentally? And then how how come it's fine one week and no the next? I, I I totally get that point as well, John. I think you're spot on with that. So I I just I it, it, it's hard. It, it it's just hard. Like I, I don't know that I would ever. I don't know that I'd ever say that Hibs are, are weak mentally because I don't know. Aye. I don't right. have any, I don't have any sort of justification for it. I don't have any way to define it. Well, see, the other thing is I think you can get you can get a career in professional football being weak mentally. Do you know the, the other thing to, to play at the level where you are and Hibs have internationalists in their team. They are sitting third in the league. There's players there who are cup winners. Not just that uh, Hibs have won uh, trophies elsewhere. You can't do that if you're weak mentally. You just can't. Like I, I, you can only go so far. If your mentality isn't good enough, you'll get found out early doors before you get anywhere near professional football. You, you'll be found out. So it, it probably is an unfair criticism. So th- there's maybe there is maybe something wrong with the psyche now. You know, every now and again. But I think consistently, you have to be strong mentally to be in that position. I think for I think just purely I know obviously fans aren't at the the games just now, but when you think about you know when we are at the games, like I think if players have to be strong mentally to put up with the abuse that they put up with from the stands, so that's that's at least one strong mental aspect. Strong mentally or death. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, next point comes to Mike Berry. He said, "Should Hibs try to sign Irvin long term, or should we go for Campbell?" I. I have reservations about Jackson Irvin, and I think it stems back to when he first came into the squad. I hadn't played football for something like, I want to say, 10 months, mm-hmm. and then just walked straight into the squad. But then I thought we started to see the merit of that. You know, he had a couple of really standout performances, you know, obviously with the exception of the St Johnston semi final, where Hibs just got barred and seemed like they, they chucked it. Um, I thought he was really showing his worth, but then I thought in the last two games it hasn't really been apparent. But then that is that because he's now partnered with Joe Newell and they haven't quite got to grips with who should be doing what. And it was just an easier understanding when Gogic was behind them because well, Gogic will do the dirty work. Yeah, that's um, a good point. so I don't on on the basis of the last two showings, I probably wouldn't. I probably on the basis on the basis of the last two showings, I probably wouldn't offer him a longer term deal. But at the same time. I wouldn't want Hibbs' season to be snookered by shoehorn him into the squad if we weren't going to have him for longer. Because I, I remember, I think it was when Dempster was still in charge, she talked about not having these loan signings. You know, yeah. you know, I, I, I might have even been uh, Paul Heckenbottom, in fact, like not getting these guys in for six months and then sort of you never get any sort of continuity in planning. And then we got Mark McNulty and Stefan and Omi back. <laughs> and here we are again. Aye. So maybe everyone just talks shit. <laughs> maybe we should try and do both. Eh? Get Irvin and, uh, and Campbell. Campbell's a cracking me player. I'd, I'd like to see him at Easter Road. I think he's um, the sort of player that fits them all for Hibs at the moment. Young, I think in that scenario, um, Hibs would try and play Irvin, Newell, Gogic, Scott Allen, Alan Campbell, all in the middle. Aye. Hibs will have a midfielder. <laughs> Put your 10 and 6 side in just for midfielder, Scott. <laughs> Was that, did I name just the five of them there again? <laughs> just the five, no, they can't have any name there. Uh, Ross Greaves said, uh, why does our manager not make proactive changes, always reactive? So I think we covered that earlier on. Uh, Neil Whelan said, uh, why have so many home games been like yesterday? Players very slow to start and lacking any dynamic drive to take the game head on. What's causing it? So w- one of the things... Um, it's a good question, and it's a, I think it's a fair question to ask as well, is why does this happen as at home? And somebody referenced Sean Maloney, so I never watched the sports scene because we got beat and I was in a huff. Um, but since Sean Maloney's point was that Hibs, when we are in control of the ball and in control of possession, and at home and expected to do the attacking, struggle. But when we are counter-attacking, and this is reflected in our home for, our away form, we play really well. We're actually really, really effective at it. And so his, I think his point was we've not quite got to terms with being the team that's got to force the issue. What do you think of that point? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. 
Aye, okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how. <laughs> that that's that's a strange one because was was the Sean Maloney's point, if I understand it properly, is he saying that Hibs haven't grasped the idea about the sort of the changes that COVID have brought to football. So, no, or is no, it or is it a leftover? It's, it's, no, it's like when you're home team. You know when you're the home team, like you imagine any, Hibs at home. To anybody, you have an expectation of how Hibs are going to go out and play. Yeah. And teams when they come to Easter Road don't play like they play when they're at home. They defend more. Do you know like Motherwell when they went to nothing up, they parked the bus and they're like, well, taking us down. So, so Hibs away from home are playing better because, because the other teams are more, more open. So the other teams are having more of a go because they have a go. Hibs can counter an attack and counter attack very effectively, and therefore we're more effect- we're, we're more efficient, score more goals, win more games. When our teams aren't coming to attack us, we struggle. That was his, his point, I think. Maybe, maybe. Sean Maloney uh, is assistant manager at the world's best football team, isn't he? Bel- Belgium, the best international se- uh, side. That's the no thing, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's also meant it was Robert, uh, Roberto Martinez, isn't it? It's not Robert Martinez, Roberto used to play for Motherwell as well, and he's in charge of Belgium. Well, listen, I, I think to get to that position, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that Sean Maloney's right. <laughs> Aye, we'll go, we'll, we'll defer to him. Fuck me. Right. Um, Prane Seas said, is Graham Alexander okay? His post-match interview on BBC Sports Sound seemed to imply he's practising for a run for Holyrood. Did you see his interview? I did. I thought it was funny. I don't know the reason for him being sent to the stands, but it reminded me of the... His interview reminded me of Scott Brown's interview for Hibs. I don't know. I don't know. Like, he was obviously... He was going to be in bother for something... Presumably the reason he was sent to the stand in the first place, so he just wasn't going to get any, any further bothered by saying whatever he said. Because I think we was interviewed asking him why it was that he was sent to the stand. Aye, what were you sent? He was like, well, aye, weren't my players brilliant? Aye. Says, aye. So he just wasn't being drawn on it. Aye. Fair play to him, right? If someone was to ask me the same question four times, I don't think that I could remember what I'd said the previous three times. <laughs> aye. The Scott Brown interview was brilliant. Mind of that, he's just, uh, were you there? I don't know. <laughs> 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 you imagine being on the other side of that and just be like oh, I'm getting stitched right up here eh? like the interviewer you know you've got to ask the questions just everyone I don't know it, it could be worse <laughs> have you seen the one where was it Walter Smith when he when he oh. shouts on Archie Knox and then Jim McLean punching was it Chuck, Chuck Young he, he was asking whether or not Loudon oh, yeah, and yeah. Basil Bowley were good enough for Rangers I'm sure that was the, the, the question of Walter Smith like are you fucking serious <laughs> And I, Jim McLean, I can't remember who it was that he punched. John Barnes. John Barnes. There uh, you go. Don't give me that. Don't give me that. And then he hooks up. <laughs> Fucking lunatic. Uh, right, Paul McKay uh, said, is this just a typical Hibs thing to do? Uh, a team needing a result always finds one against Hibs. Is that a Hibs thing or does every supporter think that about their team? It, it's hard to be... Unbiased about it, isn't it? Like it, do, it does feel that way because you're hips. But yeah. see, with COVID, and it, this is going to be like a really, really bizarre point. But because of COVID and everything, because of the way that I'd been feeling, because of you know being stuck in the house and then the snow and then the fucking golf club being burned in, like it feels like everything is against you. And being a Hibs fan at the weekend, I don't think Motherwell were in desperate need of a result. Um, I don't worth? think it was. Aye, were they? Aye, Motherwell have been toilet. Were they really bad? They, they drew with St Mirren through the week, 0-0. Um, but I think the two games before that were a 3-0 and a 4-0. It's garden. They desperately needed points. I think they were uh, sitting bottom in the league or second bottom, you know, in that area anyway. I'm going to... How do I put this? I'm going to defer to my own ignorance in this case. I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get the impression that they were in desperate need of a point, but then I'm also ignorant of the, the league table and, and places and whatnot. I thought, I, I had a wee gander at it earlier, and it seemed like it's almost split into four, um, the league at the moment. It seems like uh, Ross County and someone else are kind of rooted to the bottom and working out between themselves who's going to get relegated. Yeah, uh, talk about a four-way split before we start getting ideas at <laughs> Hamden and we'll We'll fucking have it in place soon. Um, I think I think something to be conscious of with uh, the league the way it is, like so in, in connection with that sort of four-way split, um, there's in those sort of little groups, 
there's not many points between them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think I don't think getting beat off Motherwell was was a disgrace. Um, I don't think there's any sort of weird coincidence or anything to be looked back on and say, well, we needed a result at this point, we couldn't do it. We needed a result at that point, we couldn't do it. Aye. I just think Motherwell were better at us on the, on the day. Aye. It, it, it's pretty, you don't want to live off past glories and, and all that kind of thing, but the f- four wins on the trot before it indicate that you know, teams that came to play us in those games needed wins. Aberdeen needed a win. They were desperate for one. Yeah. And we beat them. So, Aye, if, so Aberdeen if, were desperate for, maybe not desperate again, but they were looking for the points to try and get third place. Mm-hmm. Same as us. Well, they, Aberdeen hadn't scored in however many games by the time they come to Easter Road. Aye. No, they were, they were choking on it and uh, didn't get anything. So it's probably just a perception rather than, than reality. Uh, EH6, HFC said, Ross got his formation and tactics totally wrong. Teams come to Easter Road without fear now. They know they'll have a chance of taking something from the game. Looks like we have reverted back to the, as Mr Lennon called it, the boy band culture. I think the boy band culture comment came from, he wanted, I think Neil Lennon said that he wanted to instill a bit of like, steel or discipline at Hibs because he said when he was at Celtic, <coughs> um, Hibs could get a result against, say, Celtic Rangers or whoever it was and then go and chuck it away against, I don't know, like Ross County, Ross for County, example. Yeah. Or Mother, aye. Um, I don't think that a boy band culture has re-emerged the Easter Road. I, I just I don't get that impression from the players. Yeah. Um, especially because one of the critics or one of the criticisms that's been levelled at Jack Ross this year is that he can't win big games. Mm-hmm. So you can't have that boy band culture and nobody winning those games. Because, you know what I mean? Yeah. You um, didn't get third in the league with the boy band culture either. I, I actually thought at the time, Lennon's comments weren't fair as well. Do you know that you're looking at a team that's just won the Scottish Cup just you know, been another cup final and just missed out on promotion. I didn't think that as a team that had a boy band coach either. I thought he was, uh, I thought he was wrong with that. Uh, I think perhaps in the context of his comments when he was talking about his playing career, he might have been right because that feels no, it's no longer relevant to the players that were there. Do you know? No, but that, that, that's true. But then that's that's the thing um, about the uh, about the question and the. And the one that was asked before about Motherwell needing a result, like all you know, all of these teams, it's always True. been different. It's always been different players. So yeah. how can you ever say that the two things? You can't say that the two things are equal. Aye, it's a good point. I agree with you, John. Uh, William said uh, we all knew it was coming. Motherwell can't buy a win. Hibs fly. Don't need to be Mystic Meg. Correct. Uh, Winston Ingram. Uh, when Motherwell came to Easter Road earlier this season, they played three in mid in the middle of midfield, and we played two and got totally dominated. Uh, Jack Ross learned from this at Far Park and matched him up with a three and we were by far the better side. Yesterday we went back to two and we're dominated again. Probably fair. I think Motherwell did dominate middle and well, yeah. certainly until they were two 0 up. They, they dominated those positions. Um, Andy Jeffrey, uh, why has Jack Ross regressed in terms of finding a solution? Beginning of the season he would regularly tweak the formation or tactics early doors in games. It took till we went two down yesterday. Personnel changes should have been made at half time, if not earlier. It's an interesting one, right? Because it came up on uh, Quick Bang as well. It's saying you should have made the changes. We waited till we went 2 0 down, which was right after the second half kicked off. Uh, and if they were the right time to make the changes then, he should have done it at half time. But I think you like how often do you see a manager persevere with something? They maybe give it 10 minutes, so they'll go in and say, right, remember what the game plan was, boys, this is what you're meant to be doing. Next 10 minutes, go and get back on it, try and get back into the game. And then, you know, then they'll start changing things maybe from like 60 minutes onwards, 55 minutes, whatever. He needed, the, the, the goal forced his hand. When you go 2 0 down, he's like, hey, you've not got time to wait 10 minutes now. You, yeah. you've, got to, you've got to chuck everything at it. You're 2 0 down. So he made the treble substitution. I can sort of understand why he didn't do it at half time. But I can also understand the argument to say everybody could see it was going wrong. Change it at half time. What are your thoughts? Do you think. Do you think. How do I put this? Do you think Hibs were? Do you think the way that Hibs set up the, with the formation that we played, with the, the the personnel that was there, do you think that we were? Do you think we were poor? Do you think it wasn't working? 
taking into account the fact that we were we were one 0 down. Aye. I, th- I think so. I think we, we looked suspect at the back and, and vulnerable with their counter attacks, but we didn't trouble their goalkeeper. You know, until this, until we were two 0 down, I think we may have had a couple of half chances before Motherwell scored. Nothing to write home about. And then when they went one 0 up, when we didn't really a glove on them until they were two 0 up. It's funny because I, I thought. With the way the Hibs started against Hamilton, I thought that Hamilton were the, the better of the two sides right mm-hmm. up until they had the man sent off. But then Hibs had the uh, Hibs went on and won the game. And I thought that we were roughly matching Motherwell in the opening spell. Yeah. I thought this is encouraging because you know we're, we started better than we did last week, and then we conceded. And it I don't know it did seem to go a wee bit flat at that point. But then we talked about the other things earlier, like were we missing? Mm-hmm. How much of an impact would Dougie Tripod have made in the game? Did we really miss him that much? Did he was he uh, uh, an ingredient, if you like, that really made Hibs tick? Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm happy to defer to other people and say, you know, if you thought Hibs' performance was poor and we should have changed, you know, should have radically changed things at half time, then then fair dues. I, I I don't really have a, a counter argument to that. Losing the goal so quickly after half time. Like you say, that's the thing that forces his hand. Like we have to do something at that point. So you have to, you don't have the the, the luxury yeah. of waiting those the obligatory sort of 10, 15 minutes after half time to make the changes. The changes had to happen instantly. You have to go chasing the game. But at now, that point, the game was pretty much lost. Yeah, Paul Thompson said he would play Gogic every game, uh, no matter what position. I think there's a, a decent argument argument for that as well. I, I mean, Gogic has had his, like every player, I think, at some point this season has had their critics. They have been amazing one week, limited, don't know what you bring to the squad the next. Um, sometimes it's going to work out, other times it isn't. I think, like I said before, I think the the two, the pairing of uh, Irvin, when you I don't think it's worked the last two weeks. It seems something's maybe just missing a wee bit. We're maybe missing a wee bit from Jackson Irvin going forward. Yeah. Um and if if that would change to make, then like I said before, like there's there's an unpopular decision there to be made by Jack Ross. Bring Gogic in at the expense of Joe Newell or Jackson Irvin. But then who do you drop? Because you've just given Joe Newell a new a contract. contract yeah. And Jackson Irvin, you know, folk are saying like should we, you know, should we sign him for longer? I, I I don't know, has Jack Ross have Hibs made a wee rod for their own back there by you know, by their dealings. I don't know. Well, actually, it takes us nicely into the next point for Nick Hall, which is says, as much as we've had a wee run again, the formation doesn't look right. We're trying to accommodate players, forcing new players into the team, which kind of backs up your point there. John Lang said, uh, you can see the effort from the Motherwell players right from the off, pressing, chasing, whereas we are standing back, laboured passes and lacking creativity. Now, actually, I would say, for the first time in a long time, I thought we were out for in terms of how hard the team worked on Saturday. I thought Motherwell looked like a team who were willing to run through walls for the result, and I didn't feel quite the same for the Hibs players. Aye, but then maybe the, maybe that comes back to the fact that they've got a new manager there. Like every club, I think that appoints a new manager usually gets a wee bounce, and we've come up against two cl- two clubs in the last however many weeks that have had that. Yeah. Initial bounce. Um, I, I don't know what else to say other than that. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't. I can't point to that, that that individual thing and say, "Well, we got beat because they had a new manager." Um, but I like. I, I don't know whether because I, I think one of the criticisms that um, were levelled at Motherwell players before by Stephen Robinson was that there are some players here that are they just aren't performing. They aren't pulling their way. It was almost Terry Butcher esque. Yeah. So maybe the fact that there's a new manager in there, they've all got a point to prove to say, well, no, keep me. I want to play for you yeah. under Motherwell. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing because, again, you can kind of be misled. You know, you see players charging about and sometimes you think that's working hard and, and sometimes actually you're, you know, your hard work can manifest itself in different ways. Yes, it was, uh, Saturday was just one of those games where it looked like one team wanted it a bit more than the other. That, that was probably my impression from it. Uh, Stuart said, we struggle if we don't score the first goal, especially Easter Road with no fans there. Second goal was a real sucker punch. Uh, you covered that. 
Mike, uh, what the feck was David Tanner wearing? Red, uh, blue and white. He jinxed us. So was David Tanner's red, blue and white more of a jinx than Alex Miller? John? No. No. Alex <laughs> Miller is just... I. It, uh... I, I, I actually wouldn't see I, I've talked about the football gods and stuff before but I just wouldn't have Alex Miller back because that's two games now that he's jinxed Hi, he's a Jonah he is just think, definitely think I'm back for a derby please um, right last three points brought on the same line so uh, Peter Henderson uh, why can't the players hold it together when opposition teams press high uh, we constantly fold Motherwell, Livy and Ross County are perfect examples why are we so weak when the going gets tough? So a couple of things there, we, we talked about playing high and the risk that you take um, and also about that kind of perceived weakness. So uh, see, you, see when we, did, am I right in saying that we beat Levy 4-0 start of the season? Mm-hmm. So Levy would have been playing high then, presumably? I Levy would have done what Levy do. They would have been up in our, I mean, Levy, Levy were shite at the start of the season though. True, and then they had a wee spell, and then they seemed to have reverted to being a wee bit of shit again. Aye. So, did we just catch them on a on one of their good days? Yeah, I think so. I think they they had the well, the prime example of a new manager bounce, didn't they, when they went on that run? But I think they've reverted back to type now, and they looked hopeless on Sunday in the cup final. I was kind of quite happy. Would would have been happy to see them win because of Bartley, um, but aye. They look like a poor team again. Uh, Junior said, why does McGinn not get any stick for the goals yesterday? Like McGregor, he was also out of position for both goals. Uh, first one, especially when he went chasing the ball. Um, yeah, we need to watch the, the goals back. To, I never really I would kind of say, picked up on where McGinn was in it, to be fair. I would say on that point, probably evident that my tactical analysis is pretty shit. <laughs> uh, but definitely go and have a watch of uh, 9125 analysis and their breakdown. Um not that they picked out uh, Paul McGinn or otherwise. It's just a really good breakdown of the goals. Um, last point comes to David. Starting lineup didn't seem to take account that well we're playing with three nippy strikers, which exposed Daz. Goggett should be a start against all our opponents. We need to impose ourselves then win, and we really need a leader on the park. It's um, a fair. It's a fair shout. I think with the the pace aspect, I don't think that Paul McGinn or Paul Hanlon are lacking pace. I don't think Stevenson so much is lacking pace either. Um, I think the one player who I think is susceptible to nippy strikers is Darren McGregor. Um, so I don't know if there's, there was maybe an argument before the game for Jack Ross to play Ryan Porteous instead to get you know because I think you, I think it would be fair to say that he's just on the basis of looking at the pair of them that Ryan Porteous is a bit quicker off the mark. Mm-hmm. But do you disrupt that winning team? That, that was the that was the dilemma that we had, yeah. but again, I, like you know, at, at the same time, Jack Ross is there to make unpopular decisions and explain it, you know, to to the squad, to the players, why they're being picked or why they're not being picked. McGregor's no slouch, by the way, over the uh, especially over short distance, deceptively quick. No, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying that he's he's slow. I think um, you'd exactly found... say were like he looked like he was doing a caravan job. I'm sure that. Was <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> When Darren McGregor gets the big strides out, I think you saw it against, uh, there was a Hamilton player that he challenged, and I think there was maybe mm-hmm. one, I can't remember the other game. But I think when you turn them, I think a, a quick striker will usually get the better of him. If you have to make Darren McGregor turn, I think he's going to struggle in that yeah. instance. And he usually gets he usually gets a bit clumsy in the challenge at that point. He starts clambering all over them. Good day. Uh, right, St Johnston on Saturday, John. Uh, before we wrap up, uh, what's going to happen there? St Johnston on the back of our cup win and probably quite a few beers this week. Ideal time to get them. Definitely. Um, I did a wee bit of a look at the weekend there because you know how I like to challenge narratives and you know how the the established narrative that Hibs are better away from home this season than they are at home. And it, it, it's true. I think Hibs have got nine wins away from home, six wins at home. Um, so I'd like to think that Hibs are going to repeat that by getting a win. And like you say, there's probably not a better time to go up against St Johnson. Um, and it'd be interesting to see, because I, I forget the guy's name that asked the question earlier, like, you know, teams in need of a victory, or oh, there's Hibs, so it's going to be an easy touch. 
I've seen Hibs in the past where we have got that good result. So the yeah. one that we talked about, I think, maybe last week or the week before, was winning the Cup and then parading it at the Derby. I just thought that was absolute Faithful. torture. Should yeah. never, ever, ever have done that. And we paid the price for it. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if, after a big Cup defeat, St Johnston are going to be lacking. You know, because it's, it's not got the usual sort of pomp and, you know, razzmatazz about it. I'd, I'd, I'd like Hibs in that game to win. I, I fancy Hibs to win. I just do. Same here. Score? Going to go 2 0. And I'm going to say that Dodge. Do you know, this is the thing. This is the thing. So when uh, when Heckin Bottom got emptied, and then yep. Heckin, <laughs> Hibs went up to McDermott Park. I was up there with my mate, with his wee laddie, and my other mate who was brutally hungover. Um, Dodge hat trick. Hibs revolutionised, it seems. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it seemed. Um, Maybe we'll see the same again, but I'd still fancy Hibs to win. Aye, I think 2 0, 2 1. I think uh, Hibs will win as well. But catch that, them. that being said, that being said, I think um, Jack Ross would do well to look at the previous game and combat what they were doing at their set pieces and whatnot. Because it wasn't, you can't kind of point to the fact that we got caught out on counter attacks or whatever, because it seemed to be uh, our ability to, to defend aerial balls. Yeah. So we need to get better at that before Saturday. Yeah, I agree. Well, their set pieces are, are incredible. That's where they're getting all their joy from um, just now, isn't it, St. Johnson? So, if we can so no cheap free pieces. kicks. No cheap free kicks. No cheap corners. Aye. Keep it away for those areas. Cool. Right. Uh, final word would be to say good luck to Colin Miller, who I noticed today had left the, left the club. He's been there for, I think, six years. So uh, good luck with your new venture, Colin. Um, right. This episode is going to go out on... Recast, please watch us on Recast. Um, it will also be on all the podcast players on YouTube, uh, where you'll find us at our channel there as well. Uh, whenever you watch us, follow us or like and subscribe if it's YouTube. Um, please do share the word on the podcast as well. The more people to hear about it, the more people find us, which is always good for us. We will be back on Thursday with short bangers. Um, watch out for our Twitter over the next couple of days uh, for a great competition that we've got coming. Uh, and then we'll see you on Saturday for Quick Bang as well. John, thanks for your time tonight. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll catch you next time. When they trailed me down when I broke free, I drank all the whiskey in Tennessee. I don't drink water, no, you